Hello. My name is Norman Hathaway. Uh, I wasn't asked to introduce Michael Durrett. I beg to. Uh, because I think Michael Durrett is important. It's easy to get seduced by his work and the formal beauty of his work, but he's actually historically important as well. Uh, I'm old, and Michael is even older. <laughs> And the reason I raise this is not to torture him or myself, but it's to rewind a bit and highlight a significant achievement of Michael's. Uh, back in the 70s, I was a young sign painter and was curious about how to switch from doing that and going into the design and editorial world. And at that time, there was no font mania like there is now and millions of people knowing about typefaces and selling typefaces and it being a big commercial business. It would be shocking if you actually knew the name of any type designers back then. Um, and no one was doing, getting jobs doing a record sleeve or a magazine cover or anything like that. So at that time, Michael started collaborating with some very famous illustrators, contributing lettering and conceptual work. Uh, and myself and many others instantly noticed his work and uh, his interest in 1930s vernacular styles and lettering styles. Uh, personally, I don't rate American type designers at all. Uh, but I do like Jim Parkinson and Michael's work as both are distinctly American and don't ape European historical canons, a very unique uh, American style. But back to the 70s, Michael, perhaps uh, influenced by another wonderful illustrator and designer, Doug Taylor, rejected the glitzy, chromed, airbrush fashion of those times and created a very hard-edged, limited color, proletariat approach, perhaps influenced more by matchbook covers and bubblegum wrappers than Herb Lubalin and Trajan Columns. So suddenly, Michael's career took off, and it was then possible to see his lettering everywhere. And he, in my opinion, single-handedly paved the way for others to do hand lettering uh, on its own and to be used editorially. Uh, this inspired others to follow his path and inspire countless imitators, which I'm sure he remains deeply bitter about to this day. <laughs> Michael's work is very rooted in powerful childhood visual experiences that he absorbed and continues to develop. He is a very hard worker and continues to keep his head down, do his work, always maintaining the highest level of craftsmanship. All of us here are very lucky to have Michael discuss his work with us today. He lives in goddamn Los Angeles, <laughs> but has received dispensation today to visit New York as he was born in Brooklyn. Ladies and gentlemen, the magnificent Michael DeRay. Thank you. Um, before I start, I just wanted to... Um, I just feel incredibly lucky and honored to have to be here tonight that my alma mater. I mean, I was a student here, it was 48 years ago that I was last a student here, and uh, I never really envisioned an evening like this and where I've been invited to come back and, uh, and present to you all what I've been doing for a few years. So I wanted to thank everyone at Cooper who, Kara and, um, I know there's Charlotte here from the uh, Alumni Association and whoever else helped put this together. Uh, thank you so much. What inspires you? Who are your design heroes? These are the questions that we all should be asking ourselves to help us understand why we do what we do. I'm talking about designers and illustrators and anybody in the graphic arts. I realize that for most of my career, the work I've been doing has been slightly out of the mainstream of the type world. My priorities, my aesthetics, haven't always been in sync with the more accepted typographic conventions. My heroes, more often than not, are those who are other than the well-respected industry icons. I mean, I've got nothing against the, the, um, the Lou Dorfsmans, the Saul Basses, and the, the um, Paul Rands, but as much as they also have been a great influence on me, I've been looking in other directions all my life. Um, my heroes are usually those who toiled away anonymously in the early to mid 20th century. Much of what has inspired my work is the huge wealth of design that these uncredited designers did. This work that I gravitate to is usually lumped into the category of pop culture or the popular vernacular. 
And damn you, Norman, you kind of told my whole story before I even got up here. <laughs> <laughs> and it can include items like old matchbook covers. You, you, thanks. <laughs> Theater marquees, enamel signs, early and mid-20th century packaging, and all kinds of vintage ephemera. Over the years, I've been told many times that my work has a certain style or a certain look. And sometimes it's hard to have perspective on things like that. And I wasn't always sure that this was even true. I was aware that, aware that certain elements had appeared and reappeared throughout my work that I was doing. The real source of what was going on had eluded me until I realized that the look my work took wasn't a style. I discovered it was who I am my background and where I came from, and what I was exposed to when I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn. So how did I figure that out? That discovery, that first clue, came to me several years ago. Back in the 1950s, my dad was an avid stereo photographer. 3D photography was actually fairly popular back then. If you are, any of you are familiar with Viewmaster, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, Rummaging through some old boxes of photos, I came across this stereo, this stereo pair. Somebody's... Excuse me, I have to take a call. <laughs> I started studying this photo and I soon came to realize that it was absolutely central to understanding who I had become and understanding why I do what I do. In the, in the photo, front and center, are my older brother Peter, and that's me, with the, with the big uh, arrow pointing at my head. In the background, you can see the, uh, the tilt-a-whirl, various arcades, steeplechases, pavilion of fun, and the world-famous Wonder Wheel. And most of you being in New York, you, I'm sure some of these things are still there, and uh, you're very familiar with them. We lived pretty close by and frequently visited my grandparents in Brighton Beach and in Coney Island, which is just next door to Brighton. So I looked closer at the photo and I had this revelation. Here was the, my missing link. Here was my Rosetta Stone that really helped me to understand what was going on with me. Uh, the photo contained almost all the major elements that is now contained in a lot of my work. There's the bold colors, the banners, the lettering, which is arcing, bouncing, dimensional, and outlined and within shapes. I also love this photo because it tells a story. My brother had a diff very different agenda that, from me. Perhaps he was impressed by the coolness of those teens behind him, testing their strength on the mighty mic machines. <laughs> Nevertheless, Coney Island didn't affect him as it did me. I noticed myself in the photo not just in my own world, but lost in this incredible place, this cacophony of bright colors, lettering, banners, signage, lights, sounds, and smells. This was the Coney Island in the 1950s and 1960s, and this place haunted me in my dreams ever since I started going there. This, of course, is the, is the Steeplechase logo, the ultimate funhouse face. The thing about these faces, for me, was that a smile wasn't just a smile. There was something a little sinister or a little dangerous that was going on here, and it was intriguing and something more than met the eye. I didn't quite know what it was, but you'll see many incarnations of this face as we go through my work. Not exactly this face, but you'll, you'll see the inspiration. I never realized how pervasive the influence of this one iconic image was to me. It was probably the earliest example I can remember of a graphic which contains many of the elements that have gone into my work, especially the simplified, bold, flat graphics and use of color. So visiting my grandparents, going to the beach by their apartment, I had a great view of the parachute jump. It's still there, as I'm sure most of you know. It had become part of Steeplechase in 1941, after it was moved there from the 39 World's Fair. It was a ride sponsored by Lifesavers Candy. And laying out on the beach 
I would look at it, look up at the parachute jump, uh, and and uh, I just watch the people go up and down. But inevitably, somebody always got stuck at the top. That's why it was one of the the it was probably the only ride that I never went on. Apparently, Coney Island left these indelible impressions and acted on a subconscious level on me. This place shaped my aesthetic sense and directed me uh, in ways I could have never imagined. By the way, this is the very famous photo of Coney Allen taken by a guy who went by the name of Ouija. His real name was Arthur Felig, but um, uh, I just found out that where the name Ouija came from. It was that he, he was a crime photographer and he uh, would usually show up at crime scenes before the cops did. So they gave him this moniker, which came from the Ouija board, because they figured he was able to foretell the future. Anyway, back in 92, there was a film named The Public Eye about a Ouija-like character that was starring Joe Pesci as that photographer. Anyway, here I am again, <laughs> lost, completely lost in this incredibly large crowd trying to find my mom and dad. Like so many kids, I'd invariably end up under the boardwalk in what we affectionately call the chicken coop. That's not me there in the photo, but I wound up there many times. And look how nicely designed that lost children sign is. I doubt anyone would take the care to do that today. So let's jump forward a few years now to my time at Cooper. Uh, one of those is me. Uh, I'll leave that to, to you to decide. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to, to mention a couple of my professors at, at Cooper because they were incredibly influential to me and uh, really shaped me uh, in, in many ways. The first one was um, uh, my professor, Robert Haas. Um, he was a World War II Austrian refugee, uh, came here to escape the Nazis uh, in 1939. And in New York here, he founded um, the Ram Press on uh, 26th Street, working with uh, all the important New York museums. He taught calligraphy, lettering, and typography, not just at Cooper, but also at Yale and at SUNY Purchase. And um, after school, I actually apprenticed with Mr. Haas. Uh, myself and uh, a friend of mine um, named Mark Rubin uh, we would go there at nights, and we'd help him ink up his presses and, and do all the stuff, and we, we learned so much, and uh, he was just such a, a wonderful inspiration, and um, I just wanted to acknowledge him. I actually designed my very first font for his class, the very first time I actually did lettering. It was for, for Mr. Haas, which I'll show later on in, in this uh, presentation. The other guy that was really big for me at Cooper was George Salter. And he came to New York from Germany in the early, early 30s, also um, a refugee from, from the Nazis. And he taught calligraphy for 30 years, calligraphy and the history of the alphabet. But sadly, he died the year that I graduated. Um, I was a terrible calligraphy student. And um, I think he was very disappointed in me, but he never showed it. So now uh, I'll move on a little bit to after I graduated from Cooper. And uh, my very first job out of school was at a place called Photo Lettering. Uh, at the time, it was the largest photo typesetting company in the country and perhaps the world. My job was to be the assistant to this guy. Does anybody recognize him? <laughs> OK. It was legendary wild man and pilot and logo designer, typographer and lettering artist. And uh, I guess he designed over 600 fonts. I didn't know it at the time, but working with Ed was the experience of a lifetime. Through him, I learned just about everything I now know about making letters. Even though I now work on a Mac, I've been able to take everything that Ed taught me and apply it to working digitally. He was probably forgotten more about lettering and letter forms than I will ever know. I think it's safe to say that if it weren't for uh, for Ed, I probably wouldn't be talking to you here today. The last person I wanted to mention who had a huge influence on my career, no, not the last person, the, um, there's actually two more. 
uh, this one is, is Charles White III. And, uh, and Norman kind of, kind of referred to, uh, to Charlie and to Doug Johnson when he was speaking. But uh, I'd been out of school for maybe five years when I showed up at Charlie's studio with my portfolio. I'd stopped working at fo photo lettering maybe four years earlier and was kind of suffocating in a series of dead-end jobs, design jobs. But I'd been trying to sell my lettering on a freelance basis and uh, taking work home at night. So I had some long days there. When I took my portfolio around to show Charlie, he saw the potential in what I was doing and encouraged me to quit my day job, uh, where I, at that point I was working in the promotion design department at Vogue and Butterick Patterns. They still have patterns that people make dresses from? Yeah. And he offered me a small spot with a drawing table to work on in his studio. Uh, he immediately started to offer me work to supplement the other freelance work that I was getting. The first thing I did for him was to design a series of logos for him, one of which is right, you can see right there. And that's, that's Charlie, front and center, a real character. Uh, me on the left. When my son saw this photo, he thought it was Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> Uh, Carol, Carol Bauman, Charlie's assistant on the right, and Kenny Nitel in the middle. Kenny was the grandson of Max Fleischer, famous inventor and pioneer in the development of the animated cartoon, and of course you all know him as the creator of uh, Betty Boop. By the way, you see that pink radio on his lap? It was a prop for a job Charlie and I did together. These record jackets and the next couple of images were done with Charlie. He became a kind of a partner, but also a mentor to me. Now, my thing that, that I really wanted to achieve when, at the time I was working with Charlie was I wanted to get him to integrate lettering into his illustrations so that it wasn't just two unrelated elements, one superimposed over the other, but one complete image. Uh, these two are pretty good examples of that, I think. On the left, my thought was to make the letters out of the molded plastic on the pink radio and completely integrated all the titling elements of this uh, record jacket, Chuck Berry's Golden Decade. On the right was our take on Chubby Checker's Greatest Hits. All the text info was contained in the stenciling on the side of that banged up and uh, crashed taxi and in the Chubby Checker decal uh, below that. All this just seemed too good to pass up especially turning that classic Checker Cab logo into this playful adaptation of Chubby Checker's name for the cover. You notice that the lettering I did is a little bit crude and naive, like the lettering in the, in the Checker Special logo. So Charlie and I did a lot of work together. And there was a lot of work over probably the span of only about a year. Uh, with some I had more input, with some I had less. But these, these things that I'm showing you are where I, I really was able to get into it and, and, um, and put, make it part of my vision as well as Charlie's. The way I worked with Charlie was that I would carefully, um, I carefully helped with the designs and I rendered them in pencil, including all the lettering. Then Charlie would rub them down onto an illustration board, and then he painted everything. So my, my job ended with the pencil. But we had a very clear separation of what we did. Charlie did the imagery, I did the lettering. Some of the pieces we did were really complicated, like this one. Uh, the, for us, this was a pretty major piece uh, at this very early stage in my career. It allowed me to give free reign to that uh, subconscious amusement park circus banner aesthetic. Screaming Yellow Zonkers was kind of like a popcorn with a sugary glaze, maybe un not unlike caramel corn. The actual box was designed by Seymour Klost. The back and sides of the box were completely covered with crazy copy. The bottom of the box explained how to determine if it was indeed the bottom. Open the top and turn the box upside down. If the zonkers fall out, this is the bottom. If they fall up, this is the top. If nothing happens, then the box is empty. 
So the other uh, guy I worked with was Doug Johnson. And I, I considered him one of the finest illustrators from, from the 20th century. He's still around, but I don't think he's doing much in terms of illustration anymore. But uh, Doug and I treated our collaborations a little differently. Rather than have Doug rub down and paint my drawings, as we did with Charlie, uh, I created separate black and white art that was stripped together by the printer. Working like this, in a way, was a little bit of a foreshadowing of how I work today. Uh, and, uh, every, and everything leading up to when I started working digitally, but even now that I'm working digitally, creating mechanical art that was a lot li like working with Adobe Illustrator. What I tried to do with Doug was to match his style and his forms as I did in this New York City Yellow Pages cover. I can still remember the excitement when I was just starting out doing this work of being able to walk anywhere in New York City and see the Yellow Pages inside of every telephone booth. Phone booth? What's that? <laughs> After a year or two, I started get, I finding my, uh, a lot more of my own clients and did more and more solo work. I was getting a little more and more confident. I wasn't content with designing lettering to be put over a photo or over someone else's art or illustration. I wanted to have control over the entire image. This meant I'd have to come up with some sort of illustrative elements for the pieces I'd work on. This was pretty difficult for me because I wasn't an illustrator. I saw myself as a designer. But where there's a will, there's a way. And so I'd force myself to try to do with so much difficulty that which I knew others could just bang out so easily. A few years later, I was contact contacted by this uh, Japanese arts publication, Idea Magazine, that they wanted to do a feature about my work. Um, Uh, natural, uh, well, and so what, what happened was I asked them if, uh, since they're going to do this feature, would they be interested in a cover for the magazine? And they said yes. So naturally, uh, when doing this, I somehow subconsciously gravitated towards a target game or a shooting gallery look. I just went there without even thinking about it. I convinced the publisher not to print this in four color process, as they would usually do, but in four Pantone match colors. And so we were able to achieve that kind of um, almost silkscreen-like richness in color. After the idea cover, I got the call to do an album jacket for this rock group I'd, I'd never heard of called KISS. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but I actually had done work for them before. Uh, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley started out at Epic Records with the name Wicked Lester. And uh, I, I had been contacted to do this logo. I, I don't know how or when it was ever used, but, uh, but there it is. Um, and so I always look at this and I think this must have been done during my try to interlock everything design, <laughs> the design phase. So, so here we go. I love that idea cover. And I wanted to do something similar. So this, pe this is the colored pencil comp that I presented to the group at the time of uh, when we were working on this, on this concept. And uh, it's, you can see it's a little tattered and yellow with age now. Uh, but the amazing thing for me that there weren't very many changes that they had requested, mostly just the details of their faces. I think it was becoming pretty clear that by this point I was treating the lettering like an illustrative element and the illustration more like lettering. And I was finally uh, able to achieve my goal of taking control over the entire image, making it one completely integrated piece. Like the idea cover, I convinced them to go the extra mile and print in five match colors instead of using four color process. Now, although there are many other references here, there's that, still that undeniable amusement park feel. This was probably one of the first times I referenced that steeplechase funhouse face, although at this point, it certainly was all done subconsciously. It wasn't until much later that I realized that, that this graphic, could easily be from something I saw as a kid in Coney Island, like the flaming wheel of death or e even a funhouse wheel of fortune. 
And I didn't realize it at the time, but it was to become a signature piece for me and kind of iconic in the realm of, in the realm of album covers. Well, if there are any doubts about that, check out a few of the covers that were inspired by Rock and Roll Over. <laughs> Somebody me mentioned a Hello Kitty one that uh, I guess I didn't include here. For some reason, uh, this, this particular cover has gotten me a lot of attention lately, especially in the last 10 or 12 years. And that really didn't go unnoticed by the group itself, by KISS, who is still out there raking it in. And uh, so a couple of years ago, I got a call from Paul Stanley. Uh, they were working on a new album, and what they wanted to do was try to recreate the excitement from their, their early years. And they saw Rock and Roll Over as kind of representing that, that, thing, that, that thing that they had back then. And they, the, so they asked me to recreate a similar aesthetic without duplicating it. So make it the same, but make it different. Uh, which is a very difficult problem, because you're trying to, you know, you're trying to top something. You're trying to top something that uh, has become iconic at this point, and that's, you know, I don't know if that's even possible. Uh, and especially since they insisted on using photos of themselves instead of art like I did in the first cover. So for me, besides Coney Island, there was nothing else like Times Square in the 50s and 60s. And you know, Times Square is still pretty incredible today, with the, but the digital signs can be great if done creatively. I've got nothing against them. But for me, nothing will ever compare to the monumental billboards and signage that I saw there as a kid. Like this, uh, the signage on the roof over Bond's clothing was the most amazing. And it had many different incarnations. At one point, there was a real waterfall flowing between the two gigantic figures. And uh, I don't know if it's clear up here, but you see the postcard on the lower right, the figures are nude, but somehow on the on one on the upper left, there must have been some, uh, somebody said, this is improper, we have to put some clothes on these, on these characters. My dad worked at MGM in the city uh, over the Lowe's State Theater in Times Square. Uh, there were many days when I'd get off from school and take the subway out to, to the city and meet my dad. And so walking from the subway, you'd see all this weird, bizarre stuff, all this, all this signage, characters. There was Mr. Peanut outside the Planters Peanut store. Um, and uh, all, this, all this stuff, um, you know, had made these indelible impressions on me. It was kind of like, uh, if I think back on it now and had to describe it, it's like a scene out of Blade Runner, way before that film. And thinking about it as an adult, I realized how could this all not have had a profound effect on me? And I grew up in the same town as the Brooklyn Dodgers, which was the third big influence in my young life. My paternal grandparents lived one block away from Ebbets Field, and that was the Dodgers' home stadium, no longer there. From their apartment, you could hear the Dodgers fans cheering. I wasn't much of a sports fan then, or even now, but in Brooklyn, it was hard to escape Dodger culture, which was everywhere. Even though I've never been much of a real sports fan, I always loved the look of all that stuff, especially all that sports ephemera from the mid 20th century. So in my career, somehow I ended up doing a lot of sports-related work. The easiest way to demonstrate how pervasive that, influ that influence was on me uh, was with this project. I, I was asked by the Blue Jays to do eight uh, different scorebook covers. And uh, within their time frame, I decided it just wasn't feasible. I told them I could do four. And then we decided on the solution was to do four different designs, but give each design a, a two different, completely different color treatments. So here's where I started getting more and more confident in my use of color and just uh, attempting different things. But, you know, I can't help but feel that these palettes all go back to what surrounded me in Coney Island. And if you think about it, I was treating the illustration in a very similar fashion to how that steeplechase face was drawn. 
So uh, the NBA later on uh, approached me about redesigning their, this logo for the Knicks. Uh, this, this was the logo they had at the time and they said they wanted a total redesign. In the back of my mind, I had a feeling that what they say and what they would actually would accept might be two different things. So here's a few of my color comps that were just the tip of the iceberg of what I, uh, I was showing them. The three at the top and on the right were among some of the new directions I was trying to steer them to. But I had a feeling that they would pull back and included approaches like the three in the bottom on, on the left. One thing they told me they were sure of though, they absolutely had to have the, the Empire State Building in the logo. Uh, by the way, you see that NYK, kind of a, like a New York token logo? Uh, that uh, I did for them at the time, but they, they rejected it. But if you, if you see the, uh, the Knicks now, they're using it. So, okay. Uh, so this is a sequence where I just show, showing you a few of the many stages of sketching I did for this one design. I think of sketching like this, where you start out with really crude and um, very sketchy and then going tighter, it's almost like taking a piece of wood or a piece of granite and slowly carving into it, refining it more and more with each step. The one they picked was most like their old logo. <laughs> and, and also, if you notice, that there's no Empire State Building. <laughs> Uh, but I'm still proud to have worked on this, and I, it ended up being another one of those career-defining pieces that everybody knows. The Dodgers moved from Brooklyn to L.A. in 1962, and I followed them out there 30 years later. And I found that Los Angeles has its own unique look and feel. This is a famous Beverly Hills hotel sign. Moving out there, I was faced with a whole host of new influences. And I, but I always like to pick up on the quirky details, things that, like a, that a classically trained typographer would consider wrong. A couple of examples would be here, like the unequal lengths of the, those verticals in the H and the flattened bottom of the S. These are things that I, I know that I would, would have never thought of myself, but I, I always like to pick up on those things. Uh, obviously, they came out of some typographic tradition that I wasn't aware of, or they were a quirk of the, of the particular sign maker who made that sign. But, you know, you can see some of that influence here. I was asked to design signage for uh, a Hollywood and Vine restaurant, and I may have had that uh, Beverly Hills Hotel sign somewhere in the back of my mind. I didn't copy it directly, but, you know, I just used things like that as a jumping off point. I like to pick up on those quirky details, things that a classically trained typographer or a sign painter would consider wrong. The Beverly Hills signs, uh, neighborhood signs, are among the most recognized neighborhood signs anywhere, and many of them are illuminated from within. I kind of thought that this crest-like look really gives a sense of place and of history. This I did as a signage design for my local neighborhood association, which is an area of vintage Mediterranean craftsman style homes. And so I wanted to attempt to uh, achieve a similar cachet as those Beverly Hills signs and give it a sense of history. And I decided to put it in this kind of crest-like form and I thought that would be the way to go. But we fabricated this sign out of wood which uh, helped give it a, a, a really beautiful dimensionality and helped give it a sense of history and of place as if it had been around for 60 or 70 years. This was a logo for a signage for a collectible shop in Hollywood. And I had to accomplish a, a lot with a very small budget. It occurred to me that this design might be right at home over a Coney Island arcade or a Broadway billboard or even a roadside motel on Route 66. Speaking of Route 66, uh, I, I love actual neon signage, whether it's, um, whether it's either with flat graphics beneath or dimensional channel letters like a theater marquee. But graphically, it's not that simple to capture that look 
properly in flat art. Uh, and I usually tend to really stay away from trying to do neon lettering. And, uh, there was a point where everybody was doing neon lettering and it was, it was just the thing. So I, I just kind of uh, avoided it. Uh, it's very overused, or was. I don't know if it is anymore. The challenge for this cover for the squirrel nut zippers was to create the look of a roadside attraction or a roadhouse type of sign. Uh, so I decided maybe this was the, the time to attempt to do neon. And uh, I needed to build this like kind of like an actual sign with a structure of graphics underneath the neon. Uh, so it became a very complicated piece, especially because they decided they wanted to have a, a lenticular 3D cover that moved. So this is probably the, the really the only successful way you'll ever see that. If you look at the lenticular cover, it kind of works, but not great. Um, so I always like to show this because um, that, that cover really didn't work. Um, anyway, so uh, some of the early studies for this cover uh, here, um, showing that what I, the way I started out was up, up at the t upper left. I wanted this to have a more of a burlesque feel. And I had these, uh, these, two, uh, these two girls flanking the sign. And um, so what, what happened was that the, 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 um, the vocalist for the group, Catherine Whalen, she put the kibosh on that. Uh, I don't know, was this direction too sexist? But Anyway, I thought it would have looked great, but it never happened, but I like to show this anyway. <laughs> so this was the side of a truck that I photographed a long time ago. And to me, this is a great example uh, of, that I w of what I would call undesignerly design, done by sign painters who had a small bit of letter forms knowledge, perhaps, but also followed their instincts. I don't think they knew they were breaking the rules because they may not have known what the rules were. Um, so uh, you don't see this much anymore, this type of uh, painted truck side, because everything's getting wrapped these days as opposed to painted. Um, and I don't know if I should say this in front of John Downer, but you know, uh, I think sign painters, I, I've been thinking in recent years that they were a dying breed, but on the other hand, I think that there's a, a newfound interest in, in sign painting, and a lot of young people are getting into it, and I think that's terrific. Uh, I mean, just look at the popularity of that movie, Sign Painters, from a couple of years back. Anyway, uh, this is way before uh, I'd be walking around with an iPhone and could take pictures of everything, but I just was lucky enough to have had a camera with me at that point. And so I, I ended up kind of using that particular direction in a job once, but I would have never gone in that direction had I not had that really inspirational photo for me. So this and the following few uh, graphics were done for an ast astrology column in Viva magazine. Viva was kind of a um, pl playboy for women, but I, I think it actually just became um, more of a, uh, something that was picked up by, by gay guys. <laughs> I, I tried to approach each astrology sign differently, but I, I also wanted them all to feel like of a, of a piece, like they belong together, even though they're, each one was, uh, was very different from one another. Targets are another arcade element that, that reappears in my work from time to time. Uh, and like much of my other work, I wanted all the elements in this series, like the dates, to appear to be integral to the design and not added on. For example, like here in, uh, in this lever, which is scales, I, I, I somehow worked the, uh, tried to work the, the dates into like a, where you would read your, your weight, a little, a little window there. I love the, the Jules Vernish Man in the Moon character that I created here for this, for this sign. And then um, some years later, in 1981, I saw the opportunity to use that little guy again, that, that moon man. 
I had been working with the design department at Time Magazine at this point, and I got a call from Deputy Design Director Irene Ramp, who was a friend of Paul Simon's. It, it seems that Simon and Garfunkel were going to be reuniting and performing one fall evening in Central Park for one final concert. She asked me if I'd be interested in designing the poster for that. Um, I immediately said no. <laughs> so I met with Irene and Paul Simon to discuss it. Later, I decided my approach to the graphics would be to focus on the Central Park aspect of this instead of the um, Paul, Paul, Paul and uh, Art's heads. So uh, I decided it should be something like uh, an evening in Central Park under the stars. And they, they loved the idea. So, uh, but I wanted to talk about the real inspiration for this poster, which again goes back to when I was a kid. And it all seems to do that. If I hadn't been a graphic artist, I very well would have been an astronomer. But I guess my math skills were not up to snuff, so uh, that never happened. But I loved sci-fi and reading everything about the stars and planets, uh, star charts, and I saved up my allowance for months to buy my own telescope. Unfortunately, living in Brooklyn, there weren't many opportunities for real stargazing. But as a result, one of my all-time favorite things was when my parents took me to the Hayden Planetarium to see the sky show. This is one of the, the many fortune covers I've collected. Um, and it gives a pretty good idea of what it was like inside the planetarium. The unique detail, the thing that has stuck in my head all these years uh, for some reason, about, about being in, in that uh, planetarium was that the cutout silhouette, there was that cutout, cutout silhouette of the um, New York City skyline that went all the way around the perimeter of the, um, of the uh, planetarium. And it gave you the feeling that you were, um, you'd put your head back and it felt like dusk and you felt yourself in the middle of Central Park. And that to me was absolutely magical. So, this was a situation where I very consciously brought those childhood memories to bear. And uh, it drew a direct line between that feeling of being in Central Park at night looking up at the stars and a concert where you could actually do that. When these posters were done, the only way you could get your hands on one was to tear off one of the walls where they'd been sniped up. This concert uh, was attended by over half a million people. Over the years, I've had many of those who attended writing me asking where they could get a copy. And, you know, I just don't have any, and there never were any for sale. So I got tired of telling everyone there weren't any and that, uh, that there'd be no way they'd be, ever be able to get one. And I decided to create my own digital reproduction and put them up for sale. I probably should have done that a long time ago. So this was the original logo for the Graphic Artists Guild from uh, which began in 1967, and they used this until 79 when they called me to help update their logo. Uh, as you can see, I think they really needed it. When thinking about how to approach this, I thought about the great tradition of union logos, a few of which I found and put together uh, right here. I wanted this logo to have some echo of these historic logos, and used them as a standard to which I was going to aspire for the, for the guild. Initially, I remember considering the idea of like a sheriff's badge. I thought it should feel strong, perhaps intimidate the art directors and clients we worked for. <laughs> One of the problems that I had to solve was that the guild's initials, if you think about it, if you place them side by side, were G-A-G, -G, which wasn't a very positive image for the guild to promote. So one solution to that problem was to do it in the form of a traditional monogram, where the letters would fit one inside the other instead of side by side. I would have liked to have shown you all my development sketches, but unfortunately, um, this was like 1980. Those, that's what, 35 years ago. They're, those are long gone. But I, I, kept, I kept my original color comp, which you see here. And this was how I comped things up before the computer. Uh, by, by colored pencil, which was a very painstaking process. But the good thing about it was it forced you to make decisions earlier on in, the, in this design process. You really had to commit to what you were doing. 
because it wasn't like you could push a button and change the colors or move something. That was it. And this was my original tight pencil tracing from which I created the finished art. I was wondering how clear that would be. You can kind of see some of my uh, little angle notations going all the way around the circle. I'd have to, like, I used an adjustable triangle and uh, would make all these notations and figure out the, uh, how to make all the angles, you know, uh, equal to each other and uh, everything fit within certain, within certain um, parameters. Uh, I don't know how I figured that out. Now I do it on the computer and it's much easier. Um, so anyway, this, so then I would then uh, overlay my, my inkings over this, um, this tracing to do the final, the final artwork. But thinking back again about this logo and what it initially influenced me, I realized some of the things working on me were probably on a subconscious level again. After the, after the fact, I remembered that I used to go to penny arcades, both in Coney Island and Times Square, and get these stamped good luck coins on which you could imprint your name or anything else you wanted. And they were done on this machine called a metal typer. Anyway, when I thought about it, I realized that this form was very close to what I had come up with for the logo. Was that a coincidence? I'd also have to acknowledge the role that the New York City subway token may have also played. I mean, I, I, I somehow, I, you know, I gravitate back towards a lot of these things that, that um, it was just a little thing that you'd have in your pocket, but like I would somehow just fixate on it. Or even those lucky pennies you'd get in amusement parks. And I think that maybe is more apparent when you look at the metal sign we fabricated for the guild's main offices. And anyway, so this is the finished logo. We did it around 35 years ago and it's still in use today. So I just wanted now to show you exactly how I used to work before uh, pre-computer. There's an, another uh, project I did for the Guild, a cover for their pricing and ethical guidelines. So it's how I used to prepare art. Uh, I did it, uh, so you just first have the, the tracing, like the tracing for the, um, for the Guild logo that you saw before, and that would be underneath all, I, I then overlay several layers of, um, of uh, drafting film over that and ink on the drafting film. So I'm just gonna go through some of these so you can see how they all would have to fit together. Beginning at the bottom, this overlay contained the art for the textured background. Here we'll fold back the various layers of drafting film on which I had carefully drawn my work in black ink. I could say that each overlay represented one color but if two colors didn't touch each other, I could place them on the same overlay. This one contained the blue drop shadows, several other color details, and an indication of the size and placement for the Guild logo. This one contained the, the art for the gray ring and pinstripes. This overlay contained the art for the white drop shadows. And uh, this one contained the art for the red, white, and the blue. Finally, on the top layer was a sheet of tracing paper over which I would write my copious notes to the uh, engraver and or the printer. All these layers had to be perfectly aligned and registered to one another. You can see that this was a lot more complicated and time consuming than working with Adobe Illustrator. Anybody want to try doing something like that? <laughs> Okay, so in the 50s, eating out for most Jewish families meant eating out at a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> One small piece of that experience were the placemats with the Chinese Zodiac. A couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of working on a, a humorous take of this idea called the Jewish Zodiac. I, I usually get pretty leery when I'm approached by somebody who just finds me on the web. Um, I'm used to getting jobs through the established channels, like an advertising agency, a design studio, or a corporation. Anyway, this screenwriter uh, named Seth Front uh, approached me to design his idea for a Jewish zodiac. Um, obviously, he had gone to many, many Chinese restaurants when he was a kid. 
Uh, I was pretty skeptical about it, about this idea. Then I read some of his uh, text, and I thought, well, you know, this is clever and this is funny. Maybe it's not a bad idea. So I just took a chance, and I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll work with you on this. My thought was to design each one differently. Like the astrology signs I had done years earlier, I let them be tied together with some common graphic threads. I, I tried to design them as if they, some of them were like placards or decals you might find at your local mall shop or your local deli. But uh, I especially thought his copy was pretty clever, like this one. I don't, can, can it be read? Then I won't read it. I've chosen this and four other of the better ones to show you. I had a lot of fun working on this. You see what I mean about trying to make them all, each one different and unique, but yet all somehow feel like they're of a piece, of a, of a particular look, of a family. Okay. Um, anyway, when, when talking about that Simon and Garfunkel poster, I mentioned that I'd been working with the people up at Time magazine, and I, I had done several covers for Time over the years, of which I was very proud. This one was the first one that ran, and it had the distinction of being the only job where I've ever misspelled a word. Uh, this one, this is the correct version, by the way. Um, it was caught before we printed, but, you know, it, Working now wouldn't be that difficult to, to correct something like that, but this meant going back and creating new art and re everything had to register. And you, know, you saw how I did that, that uh, price and ethical guidelines cover. It's, uh, you know, it would affect every single overlay. Uh, anyway, uh, I've been uh, very much on my toes ever since about spelling. Well, when it came to choosing a style for the lettering, I don't really recall how I came up with this one, but thinking back to my childhood, I'm pretty sure that I had this good humor truck signage in the back of my head. I've always loved that sort of kind of gouty, hand-tooled lettering feeling. Again, these are all things that I think were buried in my subconscious, but which somehow all came out later. A few years later, I, I did a continuation or a sequel to that uh, Colombian Connection cover. Uh, but I had imagined this cover a little differently than what you see here, and I'll, I'll tell you how. Again, I'm going to refer back to that Good Humor logo, which, uh, you know, on hot summer days, the truck would show up on my block and broken with bells ringing. The image of that chunky ice cream pop with the graphic icicles has been stuck in my head ever since. But especially those icicles. You know the kind, wherever you see uh, where they sell ice. So remembering that good humor truck, I tried to sell the editors on the idea of putting snow caps or icicles on the letters <laughs> and using a skull instead of that nondescript pile of white stuff that they had me put in the middle. So this is what I, what I would have wanted to have done, but uh, they just didn't get the, why do you want to put snow on the letters? <laughs> This time cover may still be relevant today. Uh, and mixing my metaphors, my thought was to create a combination vintage gas pump slot machine. And I guess my love of toys and graphic game boards can't help but show through in, in a lot of the work that I do. This was a cover about the U.S.-Soviet propaganda wars done while the Cold War was still raging. In the back of my mind, I was referencing a lot of things, not just tin toys, globes, target games, and, and such, but also the title lettering from Ben-Hur, rising up in monumental fashion. Again, this goes back 
to my growing up and my visits to Times Square. Uh, one day I visited my dad and we went to a screening of Ben-Hur, which is a, an MGM movie. Uh, and um, so he brought me home from this, the, the, uh, the program for the movie and the soundtrack album. And I, I remember just like holding them and just like staring at, at these incredible letters. I'd never seen anything like that. So I'm, I'm quite sure that that was in the back of my mind as it was when I did uh, this sketch for a cover. This is one that, that didn't run. Um, but the editors felt that this one was uh, maybe too Nazi-like, too fascistic. But I should have mentioned to the editors that my direct reference for this was right downtown from the Time Life building and right across from the World Trade Center at the time on the corner of the Church Street Post Office. Can you get a more American than that? And this was the alternate design that I did for them that they picked, which was, I think, a little more tame, but still incorporating some of those same type of stylistic, architectural styled elements. When I was asked to design the Federal Eagle postage for the, for the uh, US Postal Service, I thought about all the mail shoots I'd seen in various midtown office buildings. Usually they were designed in a very severe Art Deco kind of style, so I thought I'd take those as kind of my design cue. I'd done several designs for the post office over the years, but until recently nothing ever got produced except this design. Unfortunately for me, its usage was rather short-lived because it became the postage paid envelope of choice for the anthrax mail attacks of 2001. <laughs> which, which is a distinction I'd rather have been reserved for someone else's stamp. <laughs> but, but fortunately, it wasn't the last time I worked for the post office. Uh, in 2002, I started working with, a, with an art director named Richard Sheaf, who was kind of a freelance art director for the, for the post office. They don't employ their own art directors. They work with outside art directors. And my assignment was to design a series of uh, postage stamps on the theme of American fruits and vegetables. These designs that you see here, except for the one in, at the top center, uh, never went beyond the sketch and comp stages. And what you're looking at here range from digital comps to colored pencil comps to simple pencil sketches. Ten years later, I was in conversation with another art director for the post office, Antonio Alcala, who, um, when we, we were talking about another project, and I, I always had a soft spot in my heart for these, these designs, and I still love them. And I asked him if it would be possible for him to represent these designs to the post office, and he said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And I was just like stunned and stunned amazement when he called me back a few days later and said they want to do it. Um, so, but they decided they were only going to keep the sweet corn design from the first set, the one at the, uh, up at the top there. But they added three new subjects for a total of four stamps. This was to be called Summer Harvest. So these are a few preliminary rough pencils. I, I, I always start working very, very rough because then I can I maybe look at something and I see something in it. And uh, again, it's kind of like, for me, kind of like taking a piece of wood and, and carving into it. Like the first go around 10 years earlier, my sources uh, for, my, um, for this, my reference was, was um, first vintage seed packets but because these designs were a little too delicate and fussy for, for the tiny size the stamps were gonna be, I decided to look even uh, a little more closely at uh, vintage vegetable and fruit crate labels. I, I really felt the bold stylization that they embodied would work much better in this context of postage stamps. I also took a cue, I'm not sure if I can explain this to, properly, but how many of these labels used the kind of logo graphics at the bottom for secondary information and borrowed that type of treatment uh, for the USA and forever that needed to appear on these stamps. And you'll, you'll see. One of the three new designs was for cantaloupe. 
Here you can see a progression of pencils from very rough to fairly tight uh, on top there. Uh, and like I said, these proposed stamps were uh, the tiniest size of anything I'd ever worked on. They were about three quarters of an inch by seven eighths of an inch. So the tiny size would, would really, uh, is gonna pose a legibility challenge for, for some elements. Uh, and this was really evident in cantaloupes where I started out on the left by rendering a full texture but soon realized that I have to almost eliminate it completely because it, was, it would never read at that size. It would just become almost like a, like a half tone. The simplicity that was necessary became pretty evident. Like I mentioned, the design for sweet corn was the only holdover from the first series, although the design for tomatoes was actually borrowed from one of my earlier designs for a persimmon, which, which actually never went beyond the pencil stage. The title graphic, although it wasn't technically a stamp, had to stay consistent with the look and the feel of the rest. So uh, one of the requirements was I had to keep a consistent, limited palette through all the graphics since they'd all be appearing together in one booklet. Even though it took 13 years from start to finish, the number 13 for me became a really lucky number. <laughs> Recently, I started working with Walt Disney Motion Pictures on title treatments for their films. The first one I worked on was with uh, 2012's Wreck-It Ralph. Ralph was a video game character from a 70s arcade. It was clear from the beginning that we needed to style the title treatment to have this, the feeling of a vintage arcade game logo. It wasn't difficult to find tons of reference on those uh, to help me get in the right mood. I also found plenty of free downloads of video game fonts to use as inspiration. In the end, the stylized pixelation of fonts, similar to the second one down, where it says press start, was the direction that we actually developed into the final title treatment. Here's a few of the many, many rough directions that I presented to Disney. If you remember this logo, you'll recognize the two at the bottom and the, at the center as the direction that we ended up going. Here's a few variations in color, size, shape, lettering style that we uh, initially presented. Again, honing in a little closer, we, uh, we played around with some of the letter forms and with uh, how, Ralph, how Ralph was actually gonna be depicted. And finally, the, uh, the finished logo that was used for the uh, film's campaign. Another Disney project that I was proud of, but which never really got approved, was for Pixar's recent Inside Out. This was the initial design direction from Pixar that was given to me to develop. I ended up taking that head shape and going in several different directions with it. I felt that some of them, especially this one, was pretty consistent and true to the direction they wanted me to go in. And I thought it had the right balance of casual and fun for what, was, what they wanted. But in the end, I was told that they wanted to stay even closer to their original rough concept. This one. And uh, so I presented many more simpler black and white treatments. But uh, in the end, uh, they went with the solution that they, they ended up doing in-house. You know, that's the way it goes with a lot of work I do for Disney. And, you know, I accept it. It kind of goes with the territory. Back in 2002, which was the same year I designed those first ill-fated fruit and vegetable stamps, I decided to try my hand at designing fonts. I thought, for somebody like me, it would be really a piece of cake. But I discovered that lettering and font creation were two very different disciplines. They share some of the same attributes, but much more of a technical type of expertise is required for creating fonts. And for me, that's been a really long, winding learning curve. And this is what I, what I uh, very ambitiously called my, uh, my foundry when I started. 
The whole font design thing for me began with a trip to Paris. At one of the Paris flea markets, I found this baked enamel sign, and I instantly fell in love with it, with its chips, its cracks, nicks, rust and all. And there was something about the, that unique script letter form that I loved. And so I lugged this sign back 6,000 miles to Los Angeles, and it became the, uh, my, the idea for my first font. It occurred to me that I'd never seen an upright geometric script like this before, and I decided that if I was going to get into the font game, this might be a good place to start. And I discovered that this sort of geometric connecting strip had been done many times back in the early part of the 20th century, but what I was finding all seemed like one-off hand lettering solutions, and as far as I could tell, there was no font with this type of look. The challenge for me was to be able to design a script font where every lowercase letter is able to connect with every other lowercase letter. The letters are fairly easy connect to connect when you're just doing lettering, but a font is a whole different ball game. And uh, I think it was, uh, I almost bit off more than I can chew when I decided to do a, a connecting script as my very first font. This led me to create some interesting lowercase letter forms. Uh, and at this point, I really had no knowledge of OpenType and what that technology could do in terms of alternates. So I actually designed this font with no alternates I just, and, and no ligatures. I just felt compelled to find a way to make all the letters connect. It led to some interesting character designs such as the lowercase s and the lowercase z. And for me, this is the ultimate expression of form following function. Orion became my very first digital font, and uh, this is the entire character set, and it only 185 glyphs is probably my simplest typeface. Once I finished that one, I, was, uh, I immediately started wondering what was going to be my next font. My friend, Stuart Sandler, who runs a place called Font Brothers, was quickly becoming my font guru and my mentor. He suggested that we look back through a lot of my work and, find, and look to see if there are any solutions that I did that might lend themselves to becoming fonts. Uh, he did, and, and uh, we, we started with this particular project, and, uh, uh, which was for this Hershey assignment. Uh, we, uh, this was to create a font, uh, sorry. This was to create a sign for their uh, flagship store in Times Square. But there were these faceted letters up near the top that uh, I, I really thought had the potential to be expanded into an interesting type design. At first I thought I'd call it chocolate chunk or something to that effect to honor the source. And I'm, I'm just re a real, uh, I'm addicted to chocolate, I have to say. Um, but then I thought better of it and gave it another name, Power Station. It was with Power Station that I experimented with creating a set of fonts that could be set in two colors through layered typesetting, which I think is being done more and more these days. And uh, I had a lot of fun with this one, creating graphics to promote the font that could display all its variations. And it was just recently that I stumbled upon the fact that through layered typesetting, this font could also be typeset in three colors something that I hadn't actually planned or consciously designed into the font. Still searching for ideas, we were looking through a lot of my work, and uh, I, I kept noticing that there was this script that kept reappearing many times throughout my work, like the, the word selling there in this time cover. Or like the words uh, Toronto and Scorbeck magazine in this Blue Jays cover. So Stuart saw some Stuart saw some of these samples and, and he said, you know, if you should figure out a way of doing this as a font, because if you do, it'll sell like gangbusters, no doubt about it. And I, I just didn't know how I was going to make it work. Stuart convinced me that with OpenType, with the dozens and dozens of alternates it could handle, that it actually could be achieved and made to work seamlessly. So I set out on what would be many months of work. Stuart put me in touch with lettering artist and font designer Mark Simonson, who was a tremendous help in, tremendous help in, in, uh, in 
Uh, oh, whatever. I had to make this thing go in different directions. Uh, um, and helping me get it, uh, get it uh, figured out in terms of the uh, open type technology and um, how to make it all work. How to, how to make the, the tails connect when I wanted them, how to make the tail lengths uh, extend when I wanted to. Uh, and this open te type technology to me was actually pretty magical. People still like to describe this as a kind of a baseball style font, but I think it's proven to be much more uh, and applicable to much more than sports. So I wanted to show you some of the, the initial drawings I had for this, which some of them came from other jobs, and I just kind of, uh, kind of put them all together and then started uh, my process of, uh, of figuring out what forms would work and what wouldn't. Here's some uh, studies for caps and numerals. And here's a text setting so showing some of the variety that MetroScript is capable of. Again, back to Charlie White, back into the 70s. Um, uh, Charlie and I worked together uh, with, uh, with these two guys named Ismail Merchant and James Ivory, which you probably might all be more familiar as Merchant Ivory Productions, who made Room of the View or Howard's End, Remains of the Day, on designing graphics for one of their early films, which was called Savages. Uh, this was the, the logo we did for them, and like all the work that Charlie and I did together, I drew it and he painted it. But then thinking about that project, I remembered that, that um, taking that title treatment as a design cue, I created an extreme Art Deco font that we arranged to have put on typositor strips for the purpose of photo typesetting all the film's titles and credits. For those of you who are too young to remember, typositor was a photo typesetting machine from the 60s and 70s that worked with film strips to set type exposing letters on photographic paper one at a time. Uh, a long way from your Mac. These are stills from the credit sequence I designed for, for, with that font and which were done in the spirit of the silent film cards. At the time, I unofficially called this font Chrysler after the building which helped fund this school. After starting my foundry, I couldn't think of any reason not to try to revive this design as a digital font but I figured that the original typositor film strips were long gone, never to be found again. So if I was gonna revive this font at all, I'd have to recreate the design from scratch. And fortunately, I had kept my old inking of the original lettering. And uh, so I set about to re scanning it and then recreating it digitally. And uh, this is one of the uh, early studies where, which, which I did, we're putting letters together to see how they worked when you put them into words. I stayed very true to my original design and didn't change a thing, despite the fact that I felt the impulse to change a lot of the characters to match you know, my current aesthetics. And as the name Chrysler might be a little problematic to use, and since there now was a font with that name anyway, I decided to call it Graphica. Here's a couple of examples of how it sets. Now, a little later in the talk, I'm going to talk about this convention called ZipTop. And uh, there are two other fonts that I did, which are kind of very much in, the, in that realm. But you'll, you'll understand when I show them later. But this one also, if you, if you, the tops of the, if you, you could almost like run, run a rail across the tops of these words. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's really very much in that convention, but you'll see. Anyway, again, always uh, experiencing creative block when it comes to trying to come up with a new font. Um, so one night I was driving past Cantor's, uh, a, a deli in Los Angeles, and for some reason I started fixating on this, that one sign uh, down below there. Cantor's is one of those places that doesn't have just one, not two, but three different signs, probably all done at different periods. Uh, 
but I focused on that black one to the left, and it, which stuck out like a theater marquee. In fact, it was a marquee for the S Square Theater, which opened in 1937, until it was taken over and converted by Cantor's to a deli in 1953. Anyhow, the neon on that one sign that I was fixating on somehow struck a chord with me and reminded me of the countless storefronts I grew up with in Brooklyn and of the great signage of Times Square. More than that, these particular letter forms seemed somehow emblematic of that era, and I decided to try to embody these kinds of forms into a, my own font. There were a lot of things that intrigued me about that sign and that made me see some interesting possibilities like the two-story E, that, or that squared off and horizontal top to the lowercase r. So I started sketching roughs and I, trying to see how do I would make this work. As far as the caps were concerned, there was nothing much to go by and I didn't really care for that, uh, for that cap C. Anyway, that was easier said than done and turned into probably one of my most ambitious font designs. At the time I did it, it had more glyphs than any of my other fonts. Um, well over a thousand, or 1600, something like that. And like Metroscript, I had to turn to outside help for the, uh, for the open type programming. This time I outsourced my help to north of the border to a guy named Patrick Griffin who ran a place called Canada Type. And he really helped me out with this in terms of figuring out how to make it work the way I wanted. So this is a study of how I was trying to work out the script connectors. Always a problem. In the end, I called it Delhi script as a kind of acknowledgement and a nod to Cantor's Delhi. And uh, I'm kind of very proud to say that these two these fonts were honored in 2010 and then again in 2011 by both Type Directors Club and Communication Arts. But that's not the end of the Delhi script story. Recently there was a great example of what I call life imitating art, imitating life, imitating art, ad infinitum. I got a call from um, Bonnie Bloomgarden who actually was the great-granddaughter of Ben Cantor, who was the founder of Cantor's Deli. The gist of it was that she and her sister had accidentally found me by Googling the words deli and font. <laughs> and they'd been trying to design the graphics for a food truck to be operated by Cantor's, but weren't making much headway with, with the design. So, but I had already blogged about the creation of Deli Script and my inspiration, which was uh, the Cantor sign. So she found my blog and was very taken with the story of their restaurant sign as inspiration. And she asked me to design truck graphics using Deli Script as the starting point. So I wanted to design this truck as if it had been painted, not wrapped, even though it actually would be wrapped, unfortunately. Everyone was thr thrilled with the results and now I have uh, unfettered access to all the matzo bowl soup I can ever drink. <laughs> In the end, one project morphed into the other, and for me, the lines of demarcation between my assignment world and my font world got a little blurry. In my opinion, the whole ended up being a bit more than the sum of its parts, and I became much more proud of these two projects together than I would have ever been about either of them separately. So has anyone here ever heard of the name Alex Steinweiss? Well, one, <laughs> two, three, okay, good. Well, you all should know the name. He was another kid from Brooklyn and is now called the man who invented the modern album cover. Of course, now that's kind of a misnomer also because there are no more album covers. But anyway, he did hundreds, perhaps thousands of these covers over his, over his long career, which began in the late 30s. Here's two examples showing his calligraphic lettering, which became known as his famous Steinweiss scrawl. So a few years ago, Tosh and Publ Publishing did a huge edition showcasing much of uh, Alex's work, and they asked me to emulate the scrawl for the subtitle of the book. So I worked over a piece of Steinweiss art 
and I did my version of his lettering style. While working on this, oh, sorry. While working on this, I began to think that this could make a phenomenal font if done properly, but there wasn't time enough to do it to be ready for the book's publication. So in the year following this project, I developed my own Steinweiss font, and uh, I actually contacted the, the Steinweiss family to, to get permission to do it. And I actually paid, paid royalties to them. I'd like to think of this as a kind of contemporary version of Mr. Steinweiss' signature calligraphy. And I created it in a light version with with several, uh, three, each, each of these versions have, have three variations, which I call simple, fancy, and titling, referring to the, the size of the caps and of the uh, ascenders and descenders and, and their particular complexity. And then there's medium and bold weights. Inspiration for this font came unexpectedly through a job I happened to be working on. At other times, it has come from other sources outside me or from someplace deep in my past. I've always been fascinated uh, with what is now called reverse stress typography. Back in May of 2014, Font Bureau's David Jonathan Ross did a whole talk on this topic, which was called Back Asswards. His words, not mine. This is a font that David designed a couple of years ago, which he called Manicotti. In its simplest terms, reverse stress typography may be described as reversing the positions of a font's thicks and thins. As you all should know, in traditional typography, the horizontals are the thins and the verticals are the thicks. This evolved out of calligraphy, of course, which uh, from broad knit pens and the w or brushes and the way we hold and write with those pens or brushes. But there's something really interesting about taking those conceits and literally turning them on their ears. So this is what I was referring to earlier. Back when I was a Cooper in Mr. Haas' class, it was an assignment to design a font. And this is that font. At the time, I knew nothing about reverse stress. I simply had the thought that I would be a rebel and, and do the opposite of what I had been taught. <laughs> It turned out pretty, pretty nicely, I think, and uh, I was encouraged to submit this font actually to photo lettering while I was a student. They accepted it, to my surprise, and named it Dorette Shaded, because I hadn't given it a name. And they paid me one dollar for every word they said in this font. In the end, I think my, all my checks added up to exactly twelve dollars from, from sales. <laughs> Having had that contact with photo lettering when I was a student at Cooper led me to apply for a job there upon graduation. And as I mentioned earlier, I got the job and began there as Ed Ben Gatt's assistant. So you know I'm not making this up about this font. Here's a page from Photo Lettering's Alphabet Thesaurus, Volume 3. Look it up. Okay, zip top. This is, this is out of that, that same uh, Alphabet Thesaurus, Volume 3, this, uh, what, it, what you're looking at here. The, they had this, there was a whole series of fonts that photo lettering had, which they called zip top fonts. And um, it's where the top halves of the letters are weighted a little bit heavier than the bottom halves. And so, I don't know if any of you have been reading what's up there, but it was believed that weighting the letters this way improved legibility. I never bought that idea. I just liked the way it looked. And to that end, I incorporated a zip top aesthetic into a couple of my fonts. There was a little bit in that um, in the graphica, but not really with the weight, but just a, at that kind of like that rail that ran across the top. This first one was for a font I eventually named Dynascript. This is my pencil study, mostly for the lower case. Uh, Dynascript's companion font is called Dynatype, and while Dynascript is italicized, Dynatype is straight up and down. Here's a study for some of Dynatype's caps. Dynascript's default, I hope you can follow this, is a connecting script, 
but alternately it can be set as a non-connecting italic. And Dynatypes default, I mean, this confuses me too when I, I, I try to remember which font is which. Dynatypes default is non-connecting, but alternately can be set as a connecting font. Now I'm gonna show you how. Dynascript as a connecting script. into a non-connecting italic. And this is all achieved with the push of a button on your, on your Mac. Dynatype's non-connecting default setting to its alternate upright connecting script. I think uh, OpenType is amazing with what it can do. Some time ago, I had an assignment to design a logo for the, the California Angels baseball team. And these are some of the sketches I came up with. They're all kind of playful adaptations of classic black letter or gothic styles that were once quite prevalent in vintage sports ephemera. Well, the Angels didn't use any of these, but I always remembered them as a style I might someday develop. And, um, and Stuart Sandler agreed. And so we took that one that's in the middle there and we, we revisited it. And um, doing this assignment for, for a conference, I decided to try to uh, see what I could do in terms of uh, taking those letter forms and, uh, and using them. Since this was kind of a tattooish kind of look I was going for, I felt that it kind of fit in. Okay. The letter forms in the finished font were a bit different, but I kept them in the same general style. And uh, I have to say, generally, one doesn't use black letter caps altogether in words without lowercase. So don't, don't attempt this on your own. <laughs> in a nod to the Angels logo assignment from which they were derived, I decided to call this font Dark Angel. This was the second design I did in which I paid homage to the zip top aesthetic. And like Power Station, Dark Angel can be set in layers to achieve two color typesetting. And it has also many alternate characters to try to achieve a more hand lettered look. And uh, here it is where you can clearly see how the, the zip top convention actually makes it so easy to read. Don't you agree? Dark Angel was my la latest and last foray into font design. Over the last dozen years or so, I've been trying to do with fonts what I've attempted to do with my design and lettering, and that is to be acutely aware of the history of design, but not to imitate it, but to take the attributes that speak to me and to build upon them. With my font work, I've not been content with finding old precedents to refine, but to try to create a vocabulary which, like my design work, speaks of who I am where I've come from, and which is instantly recognizable as quintessentially from me. The point I've been trying to make is that one's inspirations can be recognized and out in the open or disguised and hidden from, hidden from oneself. I went through many years of not understanding or even questioning why doing what I did or why my work looked the way it did. I thought I knew, I thought I was just inspired by quote unquote vintage stuff, but I never questioned why. Once I dug deeper, I discovered that there was a little boy from Brooklyn still inside me and still determining who I am as an adult. I found that what I do is a result not only of the things I've grown to love as an adult, but also everything that surrounded me as a kid growing up in a wonderful time, in a wonderful place. I also believe that you all have deep wells of memories from the past that may be affecting you in ways that you might not even realize. So I would urge you all to look deeper inside yourself, discover those influences that may be lying dormant, and let them awaken and come to the surface. You may never be the same. The end. <laughs> Yeah.
Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, if there's anybody with questions, uh, this might be a good time to ask. Yes? Uh, I'm curious, once you finish your typefaces, do you ever bring them back, in, other than the canters, uh, the obvious example, but do you ever bring them back into your other design work and use them for uh, the jobs you do otherwise? Uh, could everybody hear the question? The question is, do I ever take any of my fonts that I've done after I've done them and then bring them back, bring them back into some of my, my later design work? Is that more or less? And the answer is very infrequently. I, I, I hardly ever get a, a chance to design, or not a, not a chance, but it, it doesn't usually come up that I need to set type because I'm always just trying to figure things out in terms of letter forms. And uh, if I have an assignment, it's like 95% of the time it's le hand lettering. So the answer is, you know, maybe sometimes, occasionally, but not, not usually. Kara. Uh, <laughs> What, some, something about what it was like to be George Salter's student. Well, um, George was a very, um, very fatherly figure. He was very warm and very, I would even say loving for a teacher. It's not what you would expect from a professor. Um, but he could be very firm in and, 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 and stressing his points. And, um, but I know that I was, uh, I was never very comfortable with my facility to do things off the cuff, or not off the cuff, but uh, spontaneously. And uh, I never had that much control over m my wrist. And so, again, I, s I said it before, but I think, you know, he never said this, but I, I have a feeling that he was very disappointed in, in, <laughs> in me because I, uh, I, just, I just couldn't get it. Uh, I mean, I, I did as good as I could, which was, uh, which was probably passable as calligraphy, but my, my strength is more building things up and, and working them over and over and over again until I get them to, to look the, what I, to what I see in my head. But, but he was a great teacher. He was a great teacher, but maybe he, he needed to be even greater to get me to do what he wanted <laughs> me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Norman. When you're actually drawing individual characters, is there anything you miss about doing it the old way? Or is there something that you thought, oh, well, this particular aspect is a little bit better when you do things manually by hand as opposed to this? Could everybody hear that or not? Uh, it's, the question is basically, do I ever miss the way I used to draw when I was drawing with pen and ink? And could I do certain things better? Is that more or less in pen and ink than I can with the computer? And the answer is unequivocally no. <laughs> I, I would never go back to, to rapidographs. I don't know if you know what this motion means. <laughs> or just dealing with those materials, uh, which every, everything was problematic. Every, you know, um, Everything was so slow, and um, when I, I, you know, I was very reluctant to, to get on a Mac, and it was my wife, Laura, who in 1995 said, your career is gonna be over. <laughs> Nobody's gonna know what to do with this mechanical art uh, in, a, in a year or two. And so I, I took a, a weekend seminar at uh, American Film Institute where they were teaching uh, Mac, and, uh, I instantly got, with Adobe Illustrator, it just seemed like the natural extension of working uh, the, way I, the way I was working. And um, it's something, maybe it's the Bezier curves that I, you need to use, but somehow I got that immediately. Uh, I never had a problem with that, where a lot of people uh, tell me it's very difficult to make, to control it, to make it do what you want, but I, I, I you know, yeah. Um, Winona? What remains from your, from your old process? You mentioned you still do um, pencil sketches. 
Right. So uh, it's, I should say that I'm not completely doing everything on the computer. You still need to have certain hand, hand skills, drawing skills, because I don't know if this would apply to everybody, but I, you know, I can't, I can't do like on a Wacom tablet, I can't draw on a computer. Uh, I still need to use my, my hand and my wrist and, uh, and do things loosely. And uh, I've never found a way that I could do that um, on a computer that it was, it would be in any way successful. So, and I feel very lucky to have had my feet in both worlds um, because I think uh, a lot of younger people maybe kind of sidestep the whole drawing process. I, I don't, I, that's the feeling I get. Maybe it's not true, but uh, um, I, I would encourage young people to just to keep drawing and do as much as you can in, in that way. And maybe even, maybe even take up some, do, try to do some work with a pen or whatever, just to, uh, to have that experience under your belt. Um, I did. I did suggest it, but you know, it's just the way things are done now. It's 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 all about you know the bottom line, and how, you know how things how things get done. I don't, and um, I think I actually was was uh, I mentioned. Yeah, I I I, I they yeah I, I John Downer here was uh, I I thought it'd be great if he would do it, um, but you know, didn't work out. Doug. A rough rough? Well, when I, no, when I, oh, I don't know, whatever I can find. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I, I work with, uh, you know, uh, no, no uh, mechanical pencils, because, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to sharpen them as much. I remember having to sharpen those pencils to like a needle point, but then I would be constantly like, uh, shh, shh. Uh, but with the mechanical pencils, it, you know, it's. Uh, I have tracing pads. I, I, yeah, I just I just work on it. I, I rough and then I tear it off and put it underneath again and just work over it and. So. Yes. Um, you know, that's a difficult question to answer. Have I ever thought about incorporating motion graphics? I think that's, to me, that's, that would be an, like a whole other learning curve that like designing fonts that like, um, I enjoy what I do and I, I just don't want to get so caught up with the technical aspects of it all that, that I, I, I don't have fun anymore doing what I'm doing. Um, but I, you know, well, okay, a good example is maybe like, like when I create fonts, I take it up to a certain point, I, I, I draw the, the letters, the characters in Adobe Illustrator, but then I, I like work with people like um, uh, uh, Patrick Griffin, Canada type, or Mark Simonson, who then have, have very little problem taking what I, what I do and under my kind of direction, uh, creating the font work the way I want it to. I, I just don't have the patience to deal with all, all that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not what I want to be spending my time doing. I mean, with my first, let's see, with, with Orion, I did all that, and I, I was about to, like, uh, sp slit my wrists. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just becomes, it became for me just so, so kind of, uh, dull and you know just it's just like going through a process and there's not as much creativity involved for me so and, and I, I imagine it would be the same thing with motion graphics uh, I mean I've done things that have been animated and uh, I've maybe there's a few things here that I've kind of animated in a limited way but but other I, I would leave that for other people to, that I could work with to do that yeah yes
Are there things that, are, that I do now with the computer that I may not have, might not have attempted before? Probably. Yeah, I, can, I, can, um, I can't really cite a specific example, but I can, I can tackle things like, for example, I could have never done that squirrel nut zippers animation. Uh, I did that, which I did in Adobe Illustrator, basically, and then bring it into Photoshop and whatever. But how, how would I ever have done that with pen and ink? Um, and even that did take me a long time, but if I, any other way I could have done that before would have been way more laborious, I, I would imagine. I, I don't know how it could have been done. So, I mean, mostly I think that if I showed you certain pieces from certain periods of my career, that some were done uh, the old way and some were done digitally, a lot of them you couldn't tell which was which. Uh, so I think my, my aesthetic, I'm, I, I don't really let the, the, um, the technology determine uh, my vision. Although it certainly does have an influence on it that I, I can't deny, but I, I don't want to get, let that carry me away somewhere. Uh, I mean, I, I can certainly try things much more easily. I can change colors. I can move things around in a ways that I could never have done before. So in that sense, maybe, maybe yes. I, I mean, that's a complicated question. There's no easy answer to it. But uh, it's de it definitely does make a difference. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, well, I mean, that kind of question is like, how do we ever know? I mean, it's, it's like I was just talking to somebody, like I had a, I had a sore throat and, I, and I, I used a certain kind of throat spray and I got better. But how do I know if I, w I wouldn't have gotten better anyway? There's no, and, but I tell people, oh, this stuff really works. But maybe it does. But, but there's, there's no way to know. Is, is that? I just wonder if it was an interesting prompt. Well, I mean, like when I moved to Los Angeles, there's, there was like a whole kind of different feeling to being in the city. But, you know, I may have been too much along in what I am for it to have that profound an effect on me. I think the profound effects happen when you're a kid and that determine kind of where you're going and there's no way for me to, I probably, you know, I might not, I might not even be doing this at all if I grew up somewhere else, who knows? I mean, if you get in a time machine and you go back to, to the uh, Jurassic age and you move a pebble, is that gonna change all of human history? <laughs> yes. <laughs> my, my monograph. Well, I have a proposal now. If anybody here is a publisher, <laughs> give me give me your card. No, I have a proposal, and and um, I'm working on it. I can take some pre-orders. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. Oh. Hi, Claire. Usually, no. <laughs> it's kind of scary to see because, the, you know, like for each of my fonts, I didn't mention this, but for designing the font is one thing, but there's so much that goes that I've put on myself to go along with designing a font. Like, there's all the promotional graphics that I need to do. Like for each, for each, for example, for each different um, uh, font reseller that I that I give it to, I create. They have different requirements for graphics, so I create all these different graphics, and that that could take weeks. But the the the, the thing that I do, which kind of makes me crazy when I see my fonts misused, is that I create a um, a PDF uh, manual for each font to show how, you know, how to make this happen, how to make that happen. You know, if you use the, this, these keystrokes, it will do this in open type and so, and so on. And apparently very few people even look at those. 
So they're, they're, they're setting things that are, comp that are just wrong. And, but you know, it's like, it's like I've given birth to something and now it's going out into the world and like, I have no control over it anymore. So I, I, I try not to even look at that stuff. <laughs> Yes. In 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 like on a ride or something? Yeah. No, the 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 closest thing to that was recently I I was contacted by um, this brewing company in Brooklyn. Uh, it, was, it was a Coney Island Brewing Company. And uh, I designed a little label for them. Uh, but uh, I, don't know, I don't know what happened with that. I don't know if they've even used it yet. But I had fun doing that, you know. Yeah, but that's, that's really the closest. I would, I would love to, I would love to. Yes. I, I grew up in Sheepshead Bay, but I would ride my bike with my friends. To, yeah, kind of like you go over, you know, near Manhattan Beach and then you kind of veer over. On Avenue U. Oh, what was the sign again? I couldn't. No, no, no. It probably was. I mean, at one point I actually lived uh, right off of Avenue U, um, but that probably was after. I mean, I mean, it's been a long time. <laughs> I'm older than I look. I wish I had seen it. Are there any photos of it? Does, does New York have any kind of like, um, uh, like LA has like a, a neon museum? Is there anything like that here? You know, somebody should preserve them, really. Yeah. But you know, then it, it, some of them, those things are huge. What do you do with them, you know? It's, it's a problem. So. If nobody else has any questions, I can dismiss everybody. <laughs> <laughs>